Like, if I call you my brother, you know what it is. You're breaking the code. I could be calm, cool, collective. If you start wilding, I'm changing the mode. All right, everybody, welcome to 94 Feet, where we cover basketball from baseline to baseline. I'm your host, DJ Harding, and here with me today, we have Isaac, Masho, L.A., Chris, and Jake. How's everybody doing before we get started? Doing good. Everyone's chilling. Everyone's chilling. Doing good. Thank good. you for inviting us. All right. All right. Just chilling. Of course. I'm just, I'm glad everybody's here. But anyway, let's get some business started. It is NBA playoff basketball season, fellas, so I want to kick it to y'all first. First question of the day, is this the Celtics championship to lose? be honest, I think for the Celtics, the East, it needs to be theirs. It's definitely the East to lose, but there's some dangerous teams out in the West that I don't think it would be a gimme for in the finals, but I definitely think they're in a position that they should definitely take advantage of this year. But I don't think it's like make or break for the championship. I honestly feel, as a Celtics fan, we don't have anyone to worry about in the East except for ourselves. Exactly. It comes down to effort because the last couple of years, they were just slacking and fell behind in the series early and had to work more and became tired, you know? There's no way they should lose at all. And now that the heat's gone, like, it's really only us with, like, playoff, like, you know, finals experience. So we definitely have to, like, like just get better and just make that leap, you know? It's definitely ours to lose, for sure. Honestly, I, I, I agree with y'all definitely with the East. I'd full-blown say it is our championship to lose, only due to the fact that we just had such a high record and have such a gap between all the teams in the West. Now, granted, I know it's the Wild Wild West out there, and everybody's tough in competition, but I just feel like the way that we've kind of committed to the Tatum and Brown tandem, given Jalen Brown that huge max, Tatum's probably getting his this summer. We've signed Holiday to an extension. It seems like we're building a dynasty, and I feel like – the way we've looked, and we've looked way too well as a team, we looked way too good to now blow it and not win again, especially knowing the narratives that surround everybody. We'll touch on that later, of course, with narratives and what championships will mean to some players later in the pod. But I just feel personally like the narrative around Tatum of not being a winner, like this is almost like make or break for him. Well, we got to remember he's still young. He has to. With my limited knowledge on the game, I would say that with a healthy Giannis, the Bucks are a hard team to get past. Chris, That's you said hard. something about Tatum being young. I, I, what do you? I just, I want you to expand on that thought because I, I feel like we might have our heads in the same direction partially. I'm just saying he's. I, what, how old is he? You know, DJ. At time, at time of recording, I want to say he's 26. I'm gonna double 26. check that fact, but I'm pretty sure he's 26. Well, he's still below his prime. He still hasn't hit his prime. Yeah, he's only getting better, and I feel like he's made this jump this year. He's definitely making reads better and. I was kind of talking to him about like LeBron James and his podcast, but he's kind of breaking down that he's just getting better and he's reading the game a lot easier. So he's still young, but he's still getting better. I mean, that that's a fair point. I, I feel like that's the one thing that kind of works against what I'm saying of it's our championship we lose is knowing that most champions and most like the, the goats in the sense like upper echelon, a lot of them didn't break in and finally get their first championship till they were 28, 27. But I just feel like with this, the way the Celtics have kind of thrown all the chips in this year, with, like I said, getting Porzingis and Holiday and signing extensions and stuff, I feel like it's like you've kind of thrown too many chips on the table to not go win at all. And especially in the fashion, like a stat I, I saw, we've had 17 games. We won by 25 or more. That's an NBA record. I'm like, I feel like we're doing too well right now to then mess around and not win it, go all the way. Or you said, like, I agree with you. At least we got to at least get to the finals. Like that's, to me, that's, there's no excuse for that at all, personally. No, I agree, and especially no, with the yeah, last so couple fine. of years. No, yeah. I think, like, also, too, going along with it, with all the chips on the table, with how it kind of slipped from us the last two years, like the third time is a charm type of thing. It's like now we're, we're never going all in. So I, I agree with that, with saying, like, this is make or break year for it. But all right, I think we'll pitch it to the next topic here because we've already kind of touched on it. I feel like I think I heard Chris do it, but – with Jimmy Butler being out, do the Heat even still have a chance on Friday? And do they even have a chance no. beyond Friday? Why no? Just I was sorry. Just flesh no, out yeah, the, the Heat. The Heat without right, Jimmy yeah. Butler. Yeah, yeah, that, that team is done without Jimmy Butler. Like, and and they were low key when, when he was good. Runs. Yeah, they were hurting even with him. I think. I mean, so they were always him, in trouble having good. to play in the play in. No, exactly. Yeah. If they get by the Bulls, 
they have to play the Celtics, and I'm sorry, but that is not happening, especially after what happened last year. I I agree. It's definitely a hard and simple no. I feel like the, the part of me that thinks of a no, though, even before that, is just the same how this role player team don't have the same role players they did last year. Without your your Caleb Martins and Gabe Vincents and some of those guys that kind of like were key to that run, I, I didn't have much faith in them going in anyway. But like you yeah. said, knowing that Gene Bell is out the next few weeks, pretty much the Celtics, you know, playing the team that put them out last year, fiery spirit and all, getting them first round without their best player. Whereas um as Isaac called him the other day, Michael Jordan's long lost son. I'm like, I don't I don't really see how how that they have any impact. But I had to pitch the question when that news came across my screen. So I just had to pitch that. But speaking of other injuries, Giannis will miss some of round one. So now I want to ask y'all while we're talking about injuries, do the Pacers have a shot now with Giannis possibly missing a few games? If Dame wants to turn on Dame time, then no. But unless he does that, then, you know? I honestly think the Bucks just can't handle the uh, offense that the Pacers have this year. And we saw that, like, with the playing um, – not the playing, the in-season tournament, they were getting cooked by the uh, Pacers. Their offense is just too much. And I think their uh, the backcourt for the Bucks is just too weak for Halliburton. He's just going to exploit them. So I think they are in trouble, especially without Giannis. And especially their offense, it runs all through Giannis. So they definitely have a shot, especially now without him. Personally, I feel like I, – I, I secretly saw a world where Indiana could upset them even with Giannis healthy. So now that Giannis is out the picture, I really think the Bucks might be in some real trouble. So, like, I, I, to me, I kind of saw a world where it's possible only because of the fact that it's like the, the, the defense that is now lacking in Milwaukee, I, I find an issue. And the Pacers' whole play style is really just we're going to shoot threes and light them up. As, as Jake referred to, the in-season, um, the in-season tournament, I feel like right then and there we saw if they, they matched up. Now, the thing going for Milwaukee is the beef of the game ball when Giannis had that 60-point performance. So I think that's a little fire under their tails. That could have definitely helped them right there but if not for nothing else I, I just I felt like I, I was very high on the Pacers this year I mean I, as y'all know I took Tyler Halliburton and fantasy and Miles Turner so I just I really believe in the way their offense works now I'll be honest the Pacers have been slipping up lately towards the back half of the season out. yeah they did definitely fizzle out so I'm, I'm secretly hoping now by playing Milwaukee and because of that beef they could get back on track and figure it out but I just feel like with Giannis being out Personally, I think like their chances do increase a little, and I kind of had them secretly on the upset anyway. So I, I think the Pacers could probably pull this off in a, you know, a good six seven games, taking a good like two zero lead or something like that. Yeah, if the I Pacers play defense, they can do it. But all right, now we're gonna get to some fun questions. So the fun one I have for y'all today, and I feel like everybody's gonna have a different answer. Who is the most underrated team heading into the playoffs right now? Mm. I'm gonna need y'all to give your team and then explain. Then everybody give one. I was gonna say I was gonna say the Mavericks. Well, why um, why why the Mavericks? Honestly, like um Luca just said it a few days ago, like we have Kai now. Like realistically, those two players that, that are like playing happy in a healthy environment, that's that's a dangerous duo. And I think like their build up towards the end of the season has been like What's like um what's been working and like that's going right into the playoffs. All right, I guess I'll go next and then before I pitch it the rest of y'all. Well, I, I feel like we, we secretly must know DJ's answer because he's been on the <laughs> on the, he's been he has been rocking with this team since December of twenty two. But I, I feel like I feel like the most dangerous team or the most underrated team I should probably say is them Sacramento Kings. I'm just saying we they finally done put off the Warriors, which we're gonna we're gonna touch on them later. And Clay Thompson and the house the brick the house he built on Tuesday, but I just feel like with Zion out, they're going to sneak into the eighth seed. They get a Thunder team that has less playoff experience than them, and then from there, I think you could. Just, I think they can make a little magic happen and find their way, find their way in the conference finals. I'm just saying, I think that's a possibility. Light the beam. So I, that's for me personally. I, I and also Isaac, I was telling you the other day, Keegan Murray is turning into with Mike Brown as his coach, one of the best three point defenders in this league like he's hitting the three playing defense on the other end he's becoming he's coming great two-way player and i feel like he's locking up whoever they got in that little midcourt of okc even they play them and he's gonna get brandon ingram on friday and i really think there's potential there i really think the kings have potential to make a good hard run and and get and get towards the conference finals personally so so my team i've been rocking with is sacramento kings i will i will give you the kings getting past the pelicans with no zion 
I am sorry though, I do not think they are going past the Thunder. Yeah, I that's a tough that team is on his mission right now. Yeah, and they are young, they they are healthy, and they are hungry. They're hooping. So I I don't think they're getting past them honestly. But my team, I would have to go with either the Orlando Magic or the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I only say that because of the way those teams are when they're healthy. They're they're a scary team to play seven games. I'm not gonna lie to you. They they have talent. They're young. They're there. If I'm being honest, and if they could get over that edge, they could make a run for it. But they got a tough way, obviously, and they have to play each other. But I feel like whoever makes it out of there could actually make some noise. I really like the um, Suns. Um, their yeah. final game of the season, I think it was. Uh, they had to play in like a very crucial game to go into the play-in tournament, and uh, they beat the Timberwolves, I believe. And they just been open as a recent. And you see Bradley Beal, he was just excited about it being playoffs. And realistically, they have people that can just get buckets. You know what I'm saying? They have Bradley Beal. You have Devin, Devin Booker. You have KD, playoff experience. So we never know what they could do. You know, the Timberwolves are on a mission. But we got to see if playoff experience rather than hunger could like really get it, you know? So I just got to wait and see. But I like the Suns. And nobody really seems to be really talking about the Suns. I agree with that. Because they are hooping and they do yeah. have the experience. So they could do something. But it's a tough way for them as well. Well, I feel like for the the three teams we've mentioned, would be in the Cavs, the Magic, and the Suns, the the, the hard part of their of their path is who they'll probably get in the second round. Because for Cleveland or Orlando, and I'll, I'll, I'll be – Yes, and I'll be honest. I'll say I'll be honest. I'll be honest, um, Isaac. I th- I, my second choice behind Sacramento was going to be Orlando. So I definitely agree with that take. What you said, they get the Celtics. And for the Suns, most likely, if they can upset the Timberwolves with a three seed, they're getting the winner of Denver or L.A. But I'm we're just going to kind of assume that it's Denver at this point, I feel like. And I'm like, so that's that's part of their hard path is getting those teams that are kind of due to getting to – um. They're like kind of due for finals appearances. I mean, on like some, you know, those predictions and stuff you see on like those bigger networks, they are saying like Celtics Nuggets finals and they're booking it. So for all three of those teams, though underrated, their second round matchups were really what's going to kill them. Yeah, that's what I was struggling with so hard with this question is because immediately I just couldn't really think of anybody in the East because I don't see anybody getting through the Celtics. And then also going over to the West, it feels like very top heavy with like the top four or five teams. But a team that I like that isn't like a top top is the Clippers. Just uh, it's everybody they got on it and matching up with the Mavericks, they always go at it. The Maver Luca has been killing them, but I don't know. I feel like with the role Westbrook's playing off the bench this year is like creates like a whole different situation for them. And uh, I don't know. I feel like they can make maybe make something happen. But this this question is hard just because it's so top heavy this year. It feels in both both sides. But the Mavericks do look good, especially since adding um uh, their two pieces. They've been really good. I'll be honest, though. I'm very glad, Jake, you mentioned top heavy because actually the next question, and we'll just kick it right there, is is there a more overrated team in this playoff picture? I think, generally speaking, this is a really good playoff. And I feel like it's very really fairly matched in the West. But you kind of just kind of should think back. But I think the East is the Celtics, but that's yeah, tough. I believe, is it um the Thunder ended with the first seed, right? Yeah, the Thunder have the third seed right now. I feel like the Thunder's the most wild card team in the whole um playoffs, just from their lack of experience. But with how good they looked in the regular season, I really don't know what to expect from them. I feel like they could either be one of a very very dangerous team, or they could be a team that lays an egg in the first round and like just gets knocked out immediately, just because they're so young. So I just really don't know what to expect for them. So they could end up being one of the more overrated teams. But then again, I could eat my words and they could go on a crazy run. So I just don't know what to expect from them. But yeah, generally speaking, it's just two teams. It's just the Nuggets. Yeah. Uh, the Celtics. I, mean, I, I don't think they're overrated. Yeah, I, don't I think, think they're right of, where they should be. Yeah. And then everywhere else is kind of like, you know, it'd be a surprise. You Not know? A fact, so yeah. it's kind of a tough question. Yeah. Honestly, for me, I feel like there's a very simple answer. And I, I feel like for me, it's it's going to be the Timberwolves. I, I feel like as much as they've had a really good season, I know Cat is out. And I know everybody's really high on Anthony Edwards, and I respect I respect the hype. Don't get it twisted, but I do feel like them being a three seed, like I feel like they're they're like the one team that I'm like they're definitely getting put out first round from the Suns. And I, I feel like there's people who are like 
pitching, and we're and we're gonna mention Ant later. But I just I feel like people are definitely pitching the theories of them getting far, and I'm kind of like I, I I don't see it at all. Like I just I don't know what it is. I don't see them getting out of round number one. So I feel like for me, if there's like a team that I feel like is getting like some like some over deserved credit per se, it would be the Timberwolves. But honestly, like you said, it's definitely a very good playoffs, and it's gonna it's gonna be exciting for sure. But I feel like if we're pick if I gotta pick a team that's like you know the projections are more high than I prefer, it's gonna be the Timberwolves. I agree with that. I have a question. Yes. Are the Knicks considered overrated? Because they're Honestly, too deep? Uh, yeah, they're up there. So I don't think they're making it past. Who they got to play? The Sixers. They're, they're yeah, they play in Philly yet yeah, because um Philly won on yeah, Wednesday. Forget about it. Like Brunson's gonna do his thing, but Embiid's back. You know, as long as he stay healthy, they're about to fly through them. But it would have been the same thing if, if the Heat was playing them and they had Jimmy Butler out. So I don't think they was going anywhere. Yeah. I Honestly, I, somebody on the Sixers, Paul Reed, that's his name. He he full-blown said it. And I, I kind of laughed because we could touch on this topic. Now, I don't know if you saw it, but he said, you know, we're not one for ducking matchups, referring to having to play the Celtics if they lost. He was like, but, yeah, we want the easier matchup. And Paul Reed on the Sixers openly called the Knicks – an easier matchup, which I mean, I would agree with, but also I was kind of like, Paul Reed, why are you giving them bulletin board material before you play them? Exactly. Yeah, that was a bold move for them. I mean, I mean, Brunson little... can turn up and really show them what it is. Yeah. No, exactly. I... They're a dangerous team. Like I think not for like for the early rounds. I think they could definitely cause some havoc for those teams for sure. They're gonna be a problem, but they're not a serious team. But I feel like without Julius Randle, I feel like it is it is tough. Oh, facts. I forgot about that. See, I yeah, think that's the key. Him, it's tough for them. Yeah, that to me, that's the key of them being full blown overrated in a sense is the is the lack of Julius Randle now. Cause you know, I've I've, you know, being here on campus, I, I hear my fair share of Knicks fans tell me about they're going to the conference finals or whatever. And they will they'll see me there. And I'm kind of like, well, yeah, y'all, y'all still got some work to do. I mean, in a sense, there was a world where I, I genuinely I joked about it with my, some of my friends, and I was like, "I'm, I'm." Part of me is like, "Dear God," I was like, "Are the Heat really about to win this game and then run all the way down there, and then, and then they're gonna run through the Knicks, get through the Bucks or the Pacers, and then we're gonna see them in the Cross Finals again?" Like I generally was like, "Oh, not like this," and I mean the Sixers kind of in a weird way have that potential because if they get see if they see Indiana in the next round or see the Milwaukee get over the hump, maybe Embiid finally gets over that hump into the Conference Finals because he has a pretty decent road to get there. But all right, so now we go to our last question here before we take a quick break. So I think we all witnessed the Warriors fall apart. So now the real question is, is the Warriors dynasty dead? And then if you say yes, if you're their GM, what do you do? Yeah, they're definitely cooked. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, Clay, he had zero points in that last game. It was actually ridiculous. But they have to figure out what they're going to do with him. And are they going to keep him on the team? And what direction do they want to do? They still have Chris Paul on a horrible contract. They have a lot of things that they have to do, but I think they just have to get younger in some way. But that's the thing. Steph Curry, he's still, what, he's 36 now? 37? He's well, somewhere he's, in that range. Yeah, so you still have to keep him, of course, but try to put some younger pieces around him and get uh, get away from your vets because, honestly, it's just time. But they had a good run, four chips, you know? Yeah, I would I would agree. I mean, they definitely did have them their their fair share of a run. They had the dynasty, but I, like I said, I think that was the it to me. What, what it what it reminded me of with, with the Patriots in twenty nineteen when they played um the Titans in that first round and Brady threw that pick six to Logan Ryan at the end of that game. That's what it reminded me of. I was like, yeah, that's I'm pretty sure that's that's the that's the moment right there. That's it. I feel like, yep. Yeah. I I feel I feel like for me though. I agree with most of what you said, Chris, but I feel like in the going young, I I genuinely think as much as I know no one's they're not going to do it. I think there's a world where you should low key just cash out on a trade package for Steph Curry, just full blown, just blow it all the way up, blow it all the way up, get all your picks and just full blown rebuild. I just feel like at this point, you're you're with him with you're never going to be able to full blown rebuild with Curry still being there. Definitely Cause not. he's like he's gonna he's gonna be able to shoot he's gonna be able to keep you afloat and put you in that ninth tenth seed as long as it goes and I mean you can try to do the whole contending thing and try to like try to like you know rejuvenate your your dynasty and extend it a couple of years but I just I feel like in all reality you should just blow it up 
Clay Thompson free agent, let him walk. Think you know, retires jersey in a couple years when he retires. You, you, but everybody else, you just you just start trading around. I mean, even this year they were trying to trade for Chris Paul and make all these moves. And as much as I I love Chris Paul, it was like one of those you know the ship is sinking. We're trying to take duct tape and patch the ship together. I'm like, you just gotta guys, you guys let it sink and just go build a new yeah. boat. And I, so yeah. I personally I personally feel like even though I know they're not gonna do it, I feel like the the trade and Steph Curry option might be the move. With their assets now, by the time they were able to build a good enough team to want to make a run again with Steph, I feel like like time's taken from him. He's not getting any younger, you know what I mean? So I feel like yeah. they should just cut their loss now, blow it up for a big package while he still has his value. I saw something about like a sign and trade for Clay somewhere, trying to get like a um piece out of him, you know, just try to get the most out of your assets now because I feel like this team has no real identity to make a run right now with who they got. Not at all. Like you said, Jake, his, the clock's ticking because Curry is 36. So in all in all reality, he like you said, he's not getting any younger. It, at, at the most, at the most, he has about, you know, three, three, four seasons left in him for real. Yeah. For so I, yeah. yeah. So I, in all reality, like I said, I, as much as I know in reality, there's I feel like there's no way they'd actually pull the trigger and do it. I I, I do think that they, they definitely should just, just trade everybody away and get all the packages and just sink into a full-blown rebuild. Yeah, that'd be a good route, but I feel like what possibly like will most likely happen that there's um there's a trade package for just younger people. Just let Clay walk, uh, try to trade around Draymond, maybe Chris Paul. Just get some younger pieces and see if there's a possibility of running one more with Steph, but unlikely. But I would like to see them blow it up too, honestly. Uh, yeah, I haven't said anything the entire time. So about this though, realistically, I feel like. They do definitely need to go more of the route, finding like an inside big for one, um, because it's been a very long time since the Warriors have had a real big inside that was at least a threat. You know, now we have Kevin Looney being waved off for regular open, you know, layups, um, and still getting bodied in the bay by most other bigs. But if they go for another big right now, it's very hard to find somebody who's able to compete against other bigs in the league that we got. You know, Giannis, Embiid, Jokic, um, those options right now, I guess for the young guys, in my opinion, just aren't there right now. Um, and I do feel like, yeah, a big blow probably would be a lot better for them. So that way, you know, they can actually get back to somewhere. If they do a whole Steph, you know, kind of thing, I don't know how well that's going to go. I feel like they have way too much money invested in him alone. Um, realistically, everybody sees the Warriors, they think Steph Curry. Um, and if they want to go anywhere to help them get in advance anywhere, I think they have to get rid of Draymond. Because I don't know what's going on with Draymond right now. I think he's just at that age where they're all just kind of fed up. Yeah, that's just, honestly, that's the only way I feel like things are going to work out for them. I think they're done. They're not going to go anywhere. Indeed, I'll, I'll agree. They're not going to go anywhere. But to our listeners, you don't go anywhere because we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, 94 Feet is sponsored by The Harding Way. So if you like what you see here and you want some more sports content, subscribe to The Harding Way on YouTube. Because as they say, there ain't no way like The Harding Way. All right. And now we are back. So coming out of the break here, we're going to break down what championships mean to certain players. So the first one I got on the list, I think we've kind of touched on already. But Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, if they win a championship, what does it mean to their legacy? I feel like it could be the beginning of something good or it could just show that they got the job done. I think, yeah, like Isaac said, it's just kind of like their first hump that they've been struggling to get over. So that would mean that they finally are part of the championship um, crew and the league. Yeah, I got to agree with y'all. I feel like for Tatum and Brown, this, this, you show the keys to – it's, it's the keys to a car that is a dynasty possibly, but if not, they at least got to one. So now they at least they can be remembered in a good light because let's be honest, Boston fans be cruel, and the one thing that's holding them back in Beantown right now is, is not getting a chip. So once they get that, I feel like you definitely unlock the, the potential for a dynasty. If not, we can – you know they can flex it like that 08 crew, and we can have a 10th year anniversary and everything from winning one chip. But now the next one I have on the list here is the the Clippers crew of James Harden, Westbrook, and PG-13, the, the non-championship ones. We'll get to later guys of championships later, but right now we're sticking to non-championship winning players. So what about the Beard, Westbrook, and PG-13? What does the championship mean to them? I mean, not only does it just help their resume, but it also gives them that championship, the only thing that they're missing. It just puts them on that, that board for players, you know, it will be good for them. They need that realistically. 
You you know, I, I think I think of all the three, to me, Westbrook in particular, I feel like if Westbrook gets it, this kind of applies to Harden as well. But now you can now the whole you're not a team player narrative, I think, can kind of be put the rest a bit. Because for Westbrook especially, they kind of played like that he doesn't play winning basketball and the he's not a team player and like he has to be too in control of the ball. And I feel like all that kind of gets put to rest with the year he's had coming off the bench. Like the way he's kind of contributed as a six man, I feel like you can kind of put to rest that thought of, you know, he's he can't get the job done, and he's not a he doesn't have a win he's not like a winning player and plays on winning team plays winning basketball. I think that also can be applied to Harding, but I feel like more so for Westbrook because of the season he's also now had. I think that's all put to rest. DJ, what's up, Macho? Um, I just want to say like. Oscar Robertson is like regarded as one of the greatest, right? As like as an averaging like triple double like um in a season. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say that I would say that Westbrook getting a chip right now would solidify him as like one of those like you can put him in that in those shoes, you know, because he's superseded a lot of records. Um, he's like you can consider him a great, but also like if you win a championship, then that like. That just puts you amongst the best, in my opinion. I I agree with you, Masha. I, I'd say if not for nothing, he definitely does jump up a tier a, a tier or two in that all time great point guard argument. I mean, for sure, he's technically triple double. He's officially a triple double king at this point after beating all of Oscar Robinson's triple double records for sure. But I think if not for nothing else, he definitely now puts himself in like a top five point guard also conversation. Has an, also as an MVP. Yeah. So like, with he, the, with he can MVP, possibly be top five point guards of all time. Yeah. If not top three. Like I feel if, like that's a. I think I feel like there's a world where w- with him winning a championship, he then supersedes a a Chris Paul, a Isaiah Thomas, a John Stockton. Like he definitely jumps those guys. I don't know. I don't know if we're putting him in front of a. I think I think Curry and Magic definitely have the one two spot locked up. But you could definitely argue a. Does he you know pass a. I guess you could argue, like, does he pass an Isaiah Thomas or Chris Paul or John Stock? Like, those guys that are up there, like, he could be the number three guy, I possibly, and, you know, jump some of those other people. So I think that's a real conversation to have. I mean, same with James Harden, because if he wins a chip, I mean, you can kind of now do the him versus Dwayne Wade argument a little better, I think. I, I personally still go with Lean Wade personally, but given that Harden has the MVP, you, you could you could make that a real argument. And I know for PG, in a sense, like you said, I think it's just the Harden you finally have the one character. thing. I mean, Harden having multiple scoring titles also. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Winning, winning a chip, like you can't, you can't then question about the defense or anything. It's just, just like, just like um, Westbrook about the winning mentality and such. If you win a championship and you have all the accolades to match up to, like to be considered, you know, up here, I think for all of them. And that, and that level, like they, they've all done the individual achievements to be considered the greats, but then a championship as a team would be would solidify it in total. Now, I, I definitely agree. Like, it definitely does boost the resume. But now, another person to boost the resume, and we're gonna. Yeah, I was this. gonna. I, I, can I say one more thing? Oh, oh yep. Yeah. Go ahead. I feel like another person's resume it could boost. Um, he already has championships, but Kawhi Leonard. He will now have one on three different teams. You know, I was going to save that for later, and we're going to pitch the old other guys later. But since we're on the Clippers topic, what about let's, – let's pitch Kawhi now while we're at it. Why not? So I, I agree with you, Isaac. He definitely now wins the three with three teams. I'm also going to assume he has finals MVP if he wins in this case because he's the number yeah. one guy on that team. So now basically he's in the conversation where it's literally – him and LeBron as like the only two guys that have finals MVP on three different teams and three championships on three different teams. Also, though, in Kawhi's case, you now bring for the second time a first championship to a franchise after he did Toronto. Now you bring one to the Clippers. Like you finally do you get LA over the hump, something that Blake Griffin, Bob McAdoo, all, all the Clipper greats could never do. You've now finally done to the point where I'm kind of like, where does Kawhi get left in the all time ranking legacy argument? Yeah, he would definitely have to be put in the conversation for sure if that happens. I'm not going to lie to you. Because, like, you know, honestly, with Kawhi, when we talk about, like, greatest small fours of all time, we're kind of like LeBron, KD, Bird. And then from there, it's an open argument. But I'm like, I think Kawhi could sneak up into that four spot possibly with a feat like that. 
So yeah, and while we're we were touching while we're touching on that, I mean that was definitely a wild one. But you know, since we're just gonna jump around player to player, let's go across across the street in LA. And what does a chip if this magical run would be pulled off? What does it mean for LeBron and AD? Well, as a championship would add just more to your resume. Obviously, another championship would add to both their um, legacies. But LeBron, I think it would definitely just cement that GOAT status for other people. I think he's the greatest of all time. But it will kind of cement that because he's this old playing ridiculously. So, you know, it would take a Cinderella run. But if he got it done, you know, and upset the Nuggets and then the Celtics, like that would, you know, cement him as the greatest of all time. And it's not even close anymore. But that's what it would do for him. But look, for AD, you know, just kind of more cementing him being an all-time great center, a uh, second piece to LeBron, be his second chip. Yeah. Yeah, you could possibly put AD on the top five. I mean, he's already up there for power forwards, but he, he could be better than some that have won. I'm not going to say anything, but, you know, possibly in that conversation. I, I'd argue in the power forward sense, there's about – a good like five or six guys that are probably ahead of him, but he definitely cements himself in the top 10. I argue if they make the Cinderella run, that would be from the seventh seed. Anthony Davis, I think solidifies himself as the greatest Robin to LeBron's Batman. Like I think of all the, all the Robins we've seen, your Dwayne Wade, your Kyrie's, I think he would kind of have the rep of, of the best one out of the three. Cause you know, cause this Cinderella run would probably require him to do some crazy feats, but I'll be honest, even though I, at this time, currently am a Jordan GOAT supporter. I think if they would pull off the Cinderella run, I feel like, like you said, Chris, that 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 narrative's kind of put to bed. Because, I mean, in a sense, we're, we're th- coming back from 3-1 kind of does make up for a little bit of the gap in the championship argument. I think coming from the seventh seed and full-blown, taking off the defending champs, most likely taking off some other people on the way, most likely getting the Celtics, who was like, like we were arguing earlier in the pod, is probably th- their – their championship to lose, I, I think for sure that narrative kind of just goes away. But now, like speaking of the Nuggets that they top off, I want to quickly touch on if Jokic and them go back to back, what does that mean for Jokic's legacy? He's already a two-time MVP. He has a chip. He goes back to back. You know, I think he's already he's already on pace to be one of the greatest centers of all time. And with his his resume already, you know, he's you know up there with other greats, but. You know, just him being as efficient as he is in his game, nobody could really slow him down. Just really one of the most unique centers of all time, like in the names of Tim Duncan. So those two MVPs, he still has a ways to go, but, you know, just kind of more in route towards that Tim Duncan status that I think he will eventually be once he retires. Yeah, no, I, I got I to gotta agree with you there, Chris. I, I personally, I, I think the wildest part is is knowing the fact that, in a sense, he might win MVP this year on top of that. So if he were to win MVP, double up, go get the go get the finals MVP and a chip, there's a world where he kind of, in a sense, is a good one championship shy of like a Larry of what Larry Bird's done accolades wise. And you got to think of where Larry Bird's referred to in these conversations. And at that point, you know, right. I, there's a real argument where it's like, I think he kind of like Jokic in that moment right there would sort of cement himself possibly for the rest of the decade with even more years left as the best player of the 2020s. Like you could really argue like this is his decade. Cause at this point, I mean, you said like the MVPs, like all that's kind of coming within this decade. You could really like, you could really make an argument for that, that he's kind of taken over the decade or at least the front half of it for sure. So, I mean, as much as I, I feel like the third MVP putting him on that, you put him on the upper echelon. If he gets that chip, you know, like the upper echelon would definitely be deserved. Yeah, and he's the top of the MVP voting right now, like as you said. And his game is just like really nobody can guard him one on one, like nobody in the league. At least in the shooting guard position, like for Shea, you have really good wing defenders around the league, but really nobody can guard Jokic. So it's a, it's gonna be a problem for a while, like you said. Like you know, this is a decade for sure. I mean, I feel like if Jokic gets a chip right now, goes back to back, and gets the MVP. Not only is he in the conversation for being one of the best centers, but he's on the way to be in the conversation to possibly being one of the greatest of all time, if he could do that. You know, obviously he had to do more on his resume to get that, but he could be on that path if he does that. It's weird. He doesn't seem like that. He has that factor of like being a dominant force in the NBA, like Shaq did, but he might actually end up 
definitely taking over his spot as one of the greatest centers, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, he was well on his way. But as as we were mentioning, him winning a third MVP, possibly, we'll go to another MVP candidate. If Luka Doncic gets his way to the finals and wins, what does that mean for Luka Magic? It really could start him being the face of the league. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously we want to give it to Tatum or Anthony Edwards, but Luka's really putting up the numbers for it. And, you know, now he got Kyrie, as Marshall said earlier, literally they could really make a run for it and he could really be the face of the league for real. Yeah, and he's really one of those leading, like, young guys. Like, you know, the face of the league, like um, Isaac was saying. But it'll definitely cement him as, like, you know, the face of the league once LeBron, you know, is retired. You know, everybody's already sold on this Luka Magic train. And I feel like, you know, it's definitely valid because he is really skilled and you've never really seen him unless, like, it's like James Harden. But he's doing it at a different level and in different ways, you know. So if that can produce wins, then, you know, it's kind of like a new style of basketball. I feel like he's revolutionizing. You know, I, I, I agree with the one part that Isaac mentioned, the face of the league. I, I genuinely think, because you, you're right, there is secretly a full battle going on to who's the heir to the throne that LeBron has set of face of the league. You know, we pretty much watch it get passed from, you know, Kareem to Magic to Jordan to Kobe to LeBron. And in a sense, it would be the who is kind of that next person to carry that mantle. And I really think, like, that he would be on his way there. But, I mean, I feel like in a weird way, if Tatum can kind of get over the hump and get this chip – you know, swinging it back to him a little, you could honestly see that working for him as well. And then for the other person we'll pitch now, the other person in the face of the league running, what happens if the Timberwolves get there and Ant gets him a chip? What does that mean for him? Well, that's that's Michael Jordan's son. <laughs> Literally, he would just play into that role. Like, you know what I'm saying? The attitude, you know, you could watch it in the interviews. His personality is there. You know what I'm saying? He has the face of the league for it. Like, he could, he can do it. If he wins that, that's on them. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with Isaac, honestly. I mean, for me, I think the biggest part of if Ant finds a way and gets there, it's how young he is because he's the number one guy. And as we were touching on earlier with the, is this other championship to lose? We were kind of pitching the part of like most of the star athletes and those bigger people, your, your Jokic, your Steph, your LeBron, your, your Jordan, most of them didn't break out and finally get that first chip as a number one guy. Until like 27, 28. I mean, like the one exception to the rule, in a way you could argue, would be like your Tim Duncan or Magic Johnson, even though they still had your David Robinsons and Kareems there. So were they really truly the number one guy? So I think for Ant, if he could get over the hump, like at this age, this young, as a number one guy and full blown get a chip, I mean, I think that's like a, a big step in the right direction for him. I'd argue that's the same kind of the same kind of logic for a, a Shea, SGA, yeah, if he gets it too. Can I? I wanted to add on to like Shay. I would like Shay over, um, Ant because you know he's already the MVP candidate. In my opinion, he's like a little bit over Jokic because like his team was not expected to be this good, and especially them being like number one. I think they finished number one. They're gonna be good for a long time. They have so many draft picks. They have Chet. They have a really good unit already. And this was after they blew it up with the Chris Paul trade and got all those trade value from him and then Chris Paul and Westbrook and all that stuff. Like, they have a lot of trade picks on top of him being this good already, like an MVP candidate. In my opinion, the MVP, I feel like he's going to be the face of the league if he wins this for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'd say, yeah, Sam Presti in Oklahoma City was cooking because after you said, like, he hauled off um, Paul George and Westbrook and turned everybody into picks. I mean, even, like, some of the smaller people, like getting Al Horford and sending him off somewhere to us for, like, an extra pick or two and your Chris Pauls. I think he said the future is definitely bright in Oklahoma City and and – and the way Shea has played this year, he's definitely like kind of put that. Put the, he's kind of expeditiously, you know, put them on the route to be a high contender for a long time because they probably weren't they weren't supposed to be here as you were mentioning. I mean, like last year they were, they were barely etching in the play in and were getting put out, and now you go from there to full blown just we we here as the number one seed. I mean, if he wins MVP and could go all the way, like. It, like you said, that would do wonders. And like you said, maybe, yeah, I guess he could be in the face of the league argument then too. And especially but, like how he is on Instagram. I feel like, I don't know, if you ever look at his Instagram, is very, I think he's going to be set a trend for sure. Like he's very unique in how he handles his Instagram and plus how he hoops and all that. I feel like it's definitely going to be the face of how people want to be who, like want to hoop and go to the league and do what Shay's doing, you know? Yeah. And, and, I, I, oh yeah, I love the Instagram captions SGA. I think they're hilarious. The 
the, with the bars and the rap and it's very fun. But um, now I'll, I'll pitch y'all another one on the opposite side of the bracket. Uh, Luca's former teammate, Jalen Brunson. What do we think if 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 possible? I know it's pretty much a bit of a stretch, but if the Knicks somehow without Julius Randle get all the way there, what would that do for Jalen Brunson? Um, I'm gonna chime in on this one real quick. Uh, so for Jalen Brunson, in my opinion, I think that will show a lot more people in the league that he's more of a threat than most people see him to be. Obviously, I feel like real NBA players, you know, they know he's he's a great guard to have. Um, but I feel like it'll allow more players to kind of want to flock towards him, or um, you know, for or other you know organizations to want to kind of pull for him because him as a great right now as a point guard for if you back him up with another you know another good vet i feel like that can be a really good two combo um in my opinion because right now we already know what team he has to work with you know every time no matter what it comes down to Jalen brunson at the end of the day for the knicks you know we really can't rely on other people he has like julius randall and them to you know pull it pull through you know we had josh hart who you know miraculously wants to become a great nba player for a little while but we'll see how long that lasts to be honest but yeah, in my opinion, that'll just boost again Jalen Brunson's resume and a lot more attraction for him. Just kind of shake up the league a little bit. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you there. I, I definitely feel like Jalen Brunson was a was a was a big threat and we just never realized it because you know he was paired with Luca. And I'm no disrespect to Luca, but I'm like, you know, there's certain players I feel like it's certain players that just don't mesh well. And I feel like he, like Brunson, we didn't really get to see his full potential playing behind Luca who is a bit of a ball dominant guard in a way. So I do think for him, if he pulls off this, it would definitely be one of those I'm here and really put him on a, on the map and on the higher echelon. Now, I think someone who we'll go to next now, who I think is kind of in that more upper echelon and could use it is Joel Embiid. So what would that mean for him? If Embiid can get there and get the job done. He'd be kind of like a king. Yeah, I was gonna say Akeem because he's already has kind of like um similar footwork and he's able to do stuff on the post and he's already one of the most dominant big men of all time scoring wise he's really unstoppable so it would put him in that like tier you know all these championships like they like we all said it kind of boosts your your resume but you know for him specifically it put him in that range you know Akeem yeah, yeah. No, I definitely agree with that one. Well, also, I think the biggest part, if the Sixers can get it done, is the process can finally be trusted. Because let's be honest, they, they're holding on by threads right now to that narrative. Because, ooh, we, I mean, everybody has ran through there. It hasn't worked that well. So I feel like if you're, if you're the Sixers, like if you can finally get the job done, you know, all those years and all those picks and everything, it finally kind of pays off. So I think that's a big thing right there. And then also, you know, in the case of, you know, you're a coach like Nick Nurse. You finally can prove that, you know, you're a winning coach for real because I feel like the narrative around did Kawhi really carry him to a chip is kind of – I kind of feel like it's a, just there enough that, that and you can now erase any inklings of that. I think for the rest of that cast too, I think the Nicholas Batum proved, you know, why he's in the fourth quarter in the play in the other day. But all jokes aside, I mean, for the rest of that supporting cast, it would mean a lot. But I think for MB, you also now validate the MVP that you were also given. Because I, I do feel like he definitely – they were a year off, and they should have had it the year before. But if anything, you kind of do solidify the – you know, you're definitely one of the top guys in this league for real. Yeah, no, 100%. You take away realistic – yeah, you take away Embiid's injury. Um, He was kind of steamrolling. Realist, everybody was kind of like – not scared of Embiid, obviously, you know, but – No, they was terrified. They would exactly top at thirty five and ten. You know, he he was playing. He was playing. He was playing really good basketball as a team. We obviously know how Philly was in general, but for Embiid to get that, you know, get there and actually get that that ring, would yes definitely solidify as him as one of you know the best bigs in the league, obviously, or if the best big in the league, um, because of those numbers and his presence on the court, um, and. Nobody really, I don't think anybody's really thinking that, you know, Sixers would ever win. So that would, you know, change a lot of things too. But again, it, it could be one of those situations where it's just one, you know, it could be a fluke situation if they get there. But I think Embiid is at the point now where if, you know, he's trying everything he can, we can see it. He's coming back from an injury. 
a lot faster than I think anybody would ever come back from an injury like that. Being also seven foot, whatever, three hundred pounds. Yeah, no, I, 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 I detect no lies there, none at all. But yeah, no. Also, Isaac, you're right. They, they were definitely terrified. I mean, he was on pace to do some very bananas like things, if not for that injury. And I mean, I feel like on another pod, another week, we'll touch on if that rule for the MVP 65 games is valid or not. But we'll leave that to rest now because before we wrap up, as we're coming to a close, I got I got one more player I definitely want to pitch and maybe a couple extras if we have time. But what would a championship be for Kevin Durant if they could pull this off? So for Kevin Durant, I feel like if he wins it, not only does it help Devin Booker and Bradley Beal, but it puts him on that he can lead without – I mean, obviously he got help, but he can lead a team to a chip. So if you really look at it, I mean, with the Warriors, that wasn't his team. They were already there. They were 70, 73 and 9. He didn't need to go there. He went there knowing that he was going to win already because you know they was going to – they were definitely going to make noise, and they definitely had the possibility to go back and do the same thing. So, I mean, they, they were three games to one against LeBron. I mean, they should have won, but – Adding KD to that team is just – he was arguably the second-best player in the league. And then you add him to the best play, best team in the league. It just doesn't – it's not fair. So it will actually change things for him, his narrative. Yeah, I agree with that. Yep. And, like, you know, the GOAT conversation, uh, he posed this on Twitter a couple uh, a while back, but he was saying, like, oh, um, why am I not GOAT? Because he has every single accolade. He has MVPs. He has gold medal. He has scoring titles. He just doesn't have, I think, a defensive player – uh, the def- defensive player of the year or a uh, defensive player, like all team selection, but he has everything else, but it would put him more the- closer to that goat status because, you know, every goat like Maddie Johnson, Kareem, uh, LeBron, Jordan, they all have like something that they went against, you know, LeBron with the three, uh, one um, Kareem, you know, having all the chips he has. And he got like a chip at 38 oldest and old, um, you know, whatever the case may be, but basically like KD would be in that tier of guys where he's able to do something like, you know, get a chip, especially this year being top heavy like this, like, you know, definitely in the ghost status for sure. But he's nowhere near that now in my opinion, but this chip would definitely put him in that conversation. I, I, I definitely got to agree with y'all. I mean, he definitely gets put in that top 10 conversation in my opinion. I think the main takeaway though, if they pull this off, I mean, besides obviously getting Booker and a uh, Bradley Beal some rings, which would be good for their resumes, of course, you uh, you finally make your legacy valid, in my opinion. Because no disrespect to Durant, no disrespect to him whatsoever, but as Isaac pointed out, his two chips, he kind of, in a weird way, like, now nah, I don't want to say the word cheated, but like, yeah, you know I mean, it wasn't like he didn't really, it wasn't like he earned them respectfully, like, I've seen a narrative, and I've always agreed with that. Dirk Nowitzki's one championship in 2011 was more valuable than his two with the Warriors. And I'm like, if you can actually full-blown take Phoenix all the way and make it happen, you kind of now validate that championship pedigree part of your resume. And that like that narrative is now put to rest. The last person I want to pitch here before we, we end is someone who I think his narrative is the, he basically, in being loyal, never won. So what does a championship mean to Dame Dalla's resume? To Dame, in my opinion, it would kind of shut up a lot of the haters because I agree that Dame is probably one of the most underrated players in the league. Everybody doesn't think so because he's always talked about, but I think, again, a lot. He feel, I still feel like he's underrated. You know, um, Him being on the Bucks right now is, is definitely helpful. It's better position than he's been in since he's been in the league, obviously. Um, and he has a team who's kind of been there, so most of them. So, and he's been in these positions where you know it's time to get clutch, you know, playoff time come. We already seen what happens. He's made fun of Paul George over and over again. Um, so him getting that and making putting that stamp will just change just a lot of things for for everybody in the league looking at him the way they do. Everybody knows that he is a deadly player. He's a very lethal player when he is on the court. He does make a difference. We've seen it. No, Giannis made to drop 41. So he shows that he has that potential to carry. And I think it's well earned by by now at this point, in my opinion. I feel like you'll put him over like Steve Nash, some of those type of guys, you know, guys that don't have like, you know, um, that could have an MVP, but not a chip, you know, because, mm-hmm. you know, 
that's what I would think it would do for him. You know, put him over with guys like that. That may have an MVP, but not a chip. I think I would definitely argue for for Dame. There's certain things that now, like you said, it's like the, when the KD, you validate certain parts of your resume. Because to me, I, at this moment, don't understand how he made top 75 all time. But with something like a winning a championship and now, you know, being a proven winner and having it on your resume, you kind of then now make that that association to your resume valid. I feel like you now make that worthwhile, if anything else. And then especially depending on how Giannis is health-wise, if he wins the finals MVP, like I said, you just you just only more in sense validate that for sure. No, that's a fact. He definitely puts Damon up there if he gets that. He just that's a, especially if they get there to the finals. I mean, that's, that's a tough way. And you know, they struggled as a team in the beginning a little bit. So I mean, it gives them a chance to actually show him what he can actually do in the playoffs again. I mean, the Blazers wasn't really in the playoffs like that for real. So yeah. He's actually getting an opportunity because they, they have the possibility to, you know, they have, a, you know, it's Dame and Giannis at the end of the day. So it would do a lot. So, no, nah, yeah, with healthy Giannis, Dame could really do something. I mean, without Giannis, Dame could really show them back to Portland Dame if he wanted to get them through that series. And then him and Giannis can just go on a run. Yeah. And just any team, really, just overall, like any team. If they were able to upset both either the Nuggets or the Celtics this year, you know, it's doing a lot for those star players there because it's one of the most top-heavy seasons we've seen in a long time, especially with how good these two teams are playing, like, historically, you know? And I'd say nothing, another thing that went good today was this podcast. So it looks like it's about time to go. So to all our listeners, I want to thank you for listening. Once again, this was 94 Feet as we cover basketball from baseline to baseline.